Recently I learned of a very deep connection between the natural and real numbers. No, not relating to their definitions directly, it's about their cardinalities, LF null and C, and how tightly they relate to one another. By the end of this video I hope that this equality will be evident and its meaning clear, but first we need to do some groundwork. Chapter 1. Aren't they both infinite? Why, well, yes, astute viewer, they are. But what you might not know is that there are multiple different sizes of infinity. Infinitely many, in fact. The natural number's infinity is called Lf null, and it is the smallest of them all. Sets with this cardinality, or size, are said to be countably infinite, in that you could write an infinite list with all the members of the set without missing any. Any infinity larger than Lf null is uncountable. C, the real number's affinity, is an example of this, as Georg Cantor showed. By way of contradiction, assume you can write a list with all the real numbers. We can prove the list is incomplete as follows. Get the first digit of the first number, add 1 to it, wrapping back to 0 if it's 9. This will be a seed for a new number. Do the same for the second digit of the second number, then append it to the seed. Do the same for the third digit of the third number, the fourth digit of the fourth number, and so on and so forth, infinitely many times. When we're done, we're left with a real number with infinitely many digits. So, well, if it's a real number and our list is complete, the list has to contain this number, right? So, where is it? It's not in the first position, because the first digit is different from that one. It's not in the second position, because the second digit is different. And, well, that can apply to every single number on the list. So the list wasn't complete, because we just created a new valid real number that is not on the list. What we just showed is that, in some sense, there are more real numbers than there are natural numbers. Let's see if we can define this more rigorously. Chapter 2. How to compare infinities. This chapter aims to formalize what we saw in chapter 1, how to compare infinite cardinalities. A set's cardinality is, essentially, how many elements it has. This gets a bit blurry with infinite sets, but it's still possible to operate on those. When comparing cardinalities of finite sets, it's fairly obvious which one is larger. Just count up the elements and see who has a bigger number. With infinities, we can't do that. Take for instance the set of all primes. Is it larger, smaller, or equal in cardinality to naturals? What about the set of all pairs of natural numbers? To rigorously define these cardinality comparisons, we will need to introduce a new tool, surjections. A surjection is a mapping that takes elements from one set, and returns a corresponding element in another set, in a way that all elements are produced at least once. Let's call the input set A and the output set B. If there exists a surjection from A onto B, then the cardinality of A is greater than or equal to that of B. If no such surjection exists, then the cardinality of A is strictly less than the cardinality of B. These may sound like overcomplicated ways to avoid counting and, well, they are. We need to avoid counting since that won't get us anywhere in infinite sets. By creating these surjection relations, we're still comparing finite sets just fine, while also allowing us to compare infinite ones. A special kind of surjection is called a bijection, where no element in B is mapped to more than once. If a bijection exists from A onto B, then their cardinalities are equal. Bijections can be thought of as two-way surjections, from A onto B and from B onto A. Coming back to those previous questions, since we can make an infinite list with all the prime numbers, in doing that, we are creating a bijection with the naturals, using their position in the list as their bijection pair. Due to this bijection, we can prove that there are as many prime numbers as there are naturals, Lf null. The same is true for n2, the set of all pairs of natural numbers. We can list all of them systematically like this. Since all points are reached in finite time, every natural number has a corresponding element in the sequence. At first glance, both sets seem as if they are clearly larger or smaller than the natural numbers. However, both n2 and the primes have the same cardinality as them. We can see why the reals have a greater cardinality. No surjection in the form of a list exists from n onto r, as the diagonal argument showed. Chapter 3. Power Sets With cardinality out of the way, let's move on to the related topic of power sets. If you have a given set A, like this one, we can list all possible subsets of it. The empty set, the set only containing this element, the set containing only this element, and so on and so forth. The power set of A is the set that includes all of these subsets. Notice how if we assign each element a choice of either being included as 1 or not as 0, we can produce subsets by iterating over different choices. 
Choosing these two elements produces this subset, while choosing none produces the empty subset. And choosing these other two produces yet another subset. The sharp among you will realize this means for finite sets at least. The cardinality of the power set of A is always 2 to the cardinality of A. In fact, this is so important, this is extended onto the hierarchy of infinities. The cardinality of the power set of any set is 2 raised to the cardinality of the original set. This should already be ringing alarm bells, and yes, that is indeed the direction we're headed. But wait, you might ask. What if the power set of A produces a set with the same cardinality? 2 to the x equals x has no real solution, why should it have 1 in the infinities? It isn't immediately obvious that it doesn't happen, as we've seen some sets that seem to be strictly larger than the naturals have the same cardinality as them. However, Cantor's theorem tells us that this does not happen. Yes, that same Cantor from before. This theorem tells us that no function f from s to the power set of s can be surjective, which means for all sets, finite or otherwise, the cardinality of s is strictly less than the cardinality of the power set of s. This is very easy to show in finite sets because you can just count them up. Where it gets interesting is the infinite case. Let s be a set. Again, we will prove that no function from s onto its power set can be surjective, which shows that the cardinality of s is less than that of the power set of s. How do we show that? We need to construct a subset of s that no specific function f can map onto. This isn't a simple task, but I'll give you time to think. I'll give you a hint. It needs to use f itself in the definition, since we know next to nothing of it. And again, don't feel bad if you didn't get this. And the subset in question, call it t, is the subset of s whose elements are not in their mapped subsets. That, that was a mouthful, yes. Let's dissect it a bit. Every element x of s was mapped to one subset of s, say f of x. If the f of x subset contains the original element x, we throw x out of t. If f of x does not contain x, we include x in t. Now let's see why this set t cannot be mapped onto. This supposed element e either is or is not in t. What happens if e is in t? Well, t is f of e, really. So that's saying e is in f of e. But by definition of t, e can't be in f of e. So that's a contradiction. So e can't be in t. But if e is not in t, well, e is not in f of e. So by our definition of t, e should be in t. So that's another contradiction. Since both paths led us to contradictions, then the original assumption that t is f of e for some e in s must be false. And coming back to the previous problem, since there is one subset t that f does not map onto, f cannot be surjective. It then follows that if no function f can be surjective from a set s onto its power set, then the cardinality of the power set is always greater than that of the original set, even for infinite sets. Chapter 4. The Equality Before we tackle the proof itself, let's make two observations. Our sets of interest, the naturals and the reals, have bijections with these two new sets. Relation 1 is easier to show as a bijection. We can pair each natural number n with 2 to the negative n. Since 2 to the negative n is unique for every n, and every n has an associated power of 2, this is a true bijection. Let's call the set of reciprocals of powers of 2 x. Next is relation 2. It might seem weird though, we're mapping the entire number line to the interval of 0 to 1. How could these have the same cardinality? Well, the same way the naturals of primes and n2 also have the same cardinality. Even though one of them seems clearly smaller, there's still a bijection between them. Back to relation 2, we can see no horizontal line crosses the graph twice, which is equivalent to our condition of uniqueness. It also spans the entire interval y, since the function gets arbitrarily close to 1 or 0 for large enough positive or negative inputs. Now finally to the proof. I'll use a trick I've already shown you, writing numbers in binary. Except this time, the numbers are fractional. Same concept, except the powers of 2 are now in their reciprocal form. So let's take a few examples. 0 is like summing no powers of 2 at all, but since it isn't in y, let's change to one that is. This one is 0 0.011000011 and so on. The digits encode which powers of 2 to sum. 
In this case, it's a fourth, an eighth, one, one twenty-eighth, one two fifty-six, and possibly infinite and many others. Every number in the interval y can be mapped to a different choice of reciprocals of powers of two to sum. Wait, choice of elements? One is included and zero is not? Have I dastardly included seas of knowledge on you without you even knowing? Why, yes, I have. The different ways to choose and sum the reciprocals of powers of two is exactly the power set of x. But those different ways to sum are exactly the members of y, so we can establish a bijection between y and the power set of x. So we have that the cardinality of the power set of x is equal to the cardinality of y. But since the cardinality of x is the same as that of the naturals, L of null, and the cardinality of y is exactly the cardinality of the reals, C, we have that the cardinality of the power set of the naturals, 2 to the L of null, equals C. When I first learned this result, I was so excited. The two most common infinities were tied together with such a strong bond. The reals would always have a larger cardinality, yes, but I would have never guessed it to be exactly the number of subsets of naturals. After I first discovered different infinities via PBS infinite series, uncountably many seemed indescribable, too vast, too numerous, and especially no way to compare them to the naturals. There's a couple of edge cases I've chosen to ignore, but I'll acknowledge them here. Zero is outside the interval, and so is 0 0.11111, which is one, but both are in the power set of x. In fact, any expansion that ends in infinitely many ones is a problem, since those are another way to write another number. Our bijection is ruined, but if we just take these out, it turns out they are countably infinite. So it doesn't affect our final calculation, since 2 to the L of null minus L of null is 2 to the L of null. Thank you for watching this far, it really means a lot to me, and I hope you've enjoyed this proof as much as I have. See you next time on infinite... wait, no, that's not my line. See you next time!